My name is Jean Lukish, and I grew up at, with my grandparents. Uh, um, my grandparents, well, I lived with my family, but my, in the summer I spent a lot of time at uh, Wayuka Cemetery in Lincoln. So I loved the cemeteries, and that I've always loved cemeteries, and I love reading the markers to see what I can find out about the people. But I also love my horses, and I've already, you've already heard about that. I have to tell you that um, I, I love to go, I love to, to find out about Nebraska history. It's one of my major things. And when I was riding my horses a lot of times doing um, a lot of trail rides, it was much, a lot of fun because I could combine several different things there and, and that was really good. One time I found myself along a highway, scenic highway, byway, highway two now. Now you may not know where that is, or you may do, may know. It's northwest of Grand Island, and just a few miles west of a little tiny town called Cairo. It's spelled like Cairo, Egypt, but it's pronounced Cairo. And I rode my horse up with some friends up there, and I heard at the end of it, when we were talking to somebody who lived there, about this legendary story about a Mount Rushmore con connection to one particular Sand Hills Bluff in that area. And by that way, the legend was true and it was also once Mormon. So it's a perfect match for today. My program's called Secret Brothers, the, the Mount Rushmore Mormon Connection. And could you hand me my book, please? I've bring that out here. Um, it, this is just the, the program I'm going to give you right now is just the start of this. There's a whole lot more to the book. But years later, I started researching and writing this book, Secret Brother, the story of Solon Borglum's Sculpture of the Prairie, published in 2015, and soon this book became curriculum for 7th and 8th graders in Caro's near, nearby Centura School. In 2016 and 17, Hall County Historical Society President Fred Rozier, who is here, hi Fred, <laughs> and is a friend of mine, um, and I and Carol students and many others, including five members of the Borglum family, were involved in the installation of a highway marker to celebrate this Borglum site along the bluffs and Highway 2. And by the way, in 2017, two of those Carol students and one of their teachers rode with me to this Mormon Trail Center in Omaha and again to the Nebraska History Museum in Lincoln to individually nominate this Borglum secret brother into Nebraska's Statuary Hall in the State Capitol building, just as other people are doing right now at this time. Uh, unfortunately, our Borglum did not win that honor, nor did he uh, win it back in 1936 when he was first nominated by three college professors and the Omaha World Herald newspaper, but I still believe he's worthy of it. My program today, I've already begun, it begins in Denmark in 1864. Denmark? Who would be from Denmark? We're talking about Nebraska here. We're talking about the Mormons. Well, we're talking about this Borglum's father, who was then a 25-year-old bachelor carpenter and wood carver named Jens Muller, oh, excuse me, Jens Miller Hager Delamoth Borglum. What a name. In those days, Jens, whose first name was later Americanized to James Borglum, a lot easier this way, had one goal in life, to become a leader in the Mormon faith. He had done well with that for about nine years in his country of Denmark. So in 1864, when he was almost 26 years old and heard that America was welcoming Mormons from Europe to come to Utah in America, James Borglum, he, he was ready to go. As a matter of fact, he took his possessions, left his parents and siblings, went to Germany and then to England, turned 26 on the way on the train, and then he stood on the dock at Liverpool as one of 900 and 74 men, women, and children from various countries, all wanting to be American Mormons, and all wanting to board one ship, the clipper ship called the Monarch of the Sea, and the pictures in the, in the book. That ship was a huge masted sailing ship, but not big enough for every person there to have their own space for themselves and their belongings. So the word soon went out that all unmarried Mormon passengers needed to Pair up, pair up, and if you can't, if you've already been married and there's some other women who need, you're gonna have to have another wife, so let's get it going. 
and they take and take only your necessary supplies. James was not more married, so he looked around. You know, what are you going to do? 974 people you don't know. And he looked up, and there on the dock was somebody he knew. It just so happened that his young and attractive friend and neighbor, Ida Mickelson, was standing on the dock with her young brother. And so he asked, and she said yes. And by the next day, the entire crowd of nearly a 1,000 European Mormons going to America had been married in a group ceremony and were settled into the ship and on their way. But that 1864 voyage was no honeymoon cruise. During their 36 days at sea, 40 to 46 people died. 36 days. And many of them were children. And when they got to America, they realized there was a terrible civil war going on, 1864. They had many dangerous adventures, but eventually the group found themselves on the riverboat on the Missouri River along a territory known as Nebraska. But not here, not at the trail center, not in Omaha. That's not where they were going. Instead, they were offloaded further south and closer to Nebraska City at a jumping off place for a town called Wyoming or Old Wyoming in southeastern Nebraska. Today, if you look up the town of Wyoming on a Nebraska map, you're not likely to find it. And even if you do find it, well, you aren't likely to see much because the town of Old Wyoming is gone and that hard to get to area is now mostly cow pasture, private property, and too far off the beaten path to be marked on, more, on Nebraska maps. Their Mormon journey across Nebraska and Colorado would be no, pri uh, no picnic either. But things went somewhat better than, than they had been from previous Mormons year, years before. That old Wyoming, Nebraska City area was further south of most of the other Overland trails, and that meant that the Mormons didn't have as many problems with other immigrants or other people down there. The trail was also closer to the new Russell's, Major, and Waddell freight wagon trails, so there were some advantages to that, too. In fact, by then the Mormons had their own oxen-drawn freight wagons called down and back wagons moving on or near those freight, major freight trails in southeastern Nebraska. The Mormon down and back drivers brought goods and other things from Utah to be sold in Nebraska and points east, and then those empty wagons were refilled with foodstuffs and supplies and the new Mormons' belongings. The best thing about that was those newly arriving Mormons would not need to pull all their belongings in hand carts. Whew. The down and back wagons would transport their goods, but not them. They would have to walk all the way to Utah, about a thousand miles, crossing rivers and camping out all along the way. They probably set off on the old Wyoming Trail and then took the Nebraska City Cutoff Trail and then later the old Fort Kearney Trail, three of the southern, southeastern Nebraska trails before crossing the Platte River near old, uh, old Fort Kearney and moving northwest. But of course, there were always other things that slowed them down. Now, James and Ida Bordlum, that's the couple we're talking about, and Ida's little brother finally reached Salt Lake City in September of 1864. They moved into a one room of a two room house and James found a job. The following year, their first child, a son named James Miller Bordlum Jr. was born. A year and two months later, in late November of 1865, James Borglum's sister, Marin Borglum Hegstead, her husband and their new baby arrived and moved in with James's family, enlarging the family from four to seven and then to eight all at once. Remember, they're living in one room in a house. The Hegsteads had, very little, had, had a very difficult and dangerous journey from Denmark, and they had also brought that eighth member of the family with them. Her name was Christina Mickelson, and she was James Borglum's first wife's unmarried 19-year-old sister. Guess what? It was soon decided by the Mormon council that with two full families living in that side of the house and one unmarried teenage girl, Christina Mickelson, well, she had to become somebody's wife. <laughs> and so she became James's second wife or sister wife. They were soon married, and, but the two sister wives did not get along well. And things were very crowded with eight people in that room on the one side of the house. 
Thinking that things couldn't get worse and hoping that he would be seen as a strong Mormon leader, James agreed to take his two wives and his son and some unrelated Mormon families. And I don't know what happened to his little brother-in-law. We, He kind of disappeared there somewhere. Uh, across the Utah border front into Idaho to start a new Mormon settlement or colony. James was a good carpenter, so he built a cabin there, but that summer of 1866 was too short and too cold for crops, and the following winter and spring were bad too. 1867 brought grasshoppers, hostile Indians, and two new babies. In March, James's second wife, remember Christina, the new one? She gave birth to her first child, John Gutson, Wardlam. Ever heard that name before? Mount Rushmore? Better known to the world as Gutson of Mount Rushmore fame. And a month later, in April, James's first wife, Ida Mickelson Wardlam, gave birth to her second son, August Stanislaus Wardlam. James's three sons got along pretty well, but his two wives didn't. And many things weren't getting any better, and so James became very frustrated. When James heard that the new Union Pacific Transcontinental Railroad had a base in Ogden, Utah, he decided to take his second wife, Christina, and their only son, Gutson, to Ogden. You know, it's easier to take your one wife and one son than it is to take your old wife and the two sons, you know. So he decided to get a job with the railroad. Things worked out, they had a nice house there, they were comfortable. But James knew that he had to go back to his first wife, Ida, and her two baby boys. He paid off all his bills to the Mormons and to others and sold his Idaho cabin and brought Ida and her two babies to Ogden to live in a separate house. Now, on December 22, 1868, James's second wife, again, Christina Mickelson Wardlam, gave birth to her second and last child by James, and his name was Solon Hannibal Wardlam, and he's the subject of this book, okay? He was Gutson's full brother, and he would later be James's secret son, second secret son. <clears throat> Not to be outdone, six months later in 1869, first wife Ida Mickelson Wardlam had her own third son, and so Arnold, his name was Arnold Socrates, Socrates Wardlam. Solon and Arnold would often be best friends, and they were sometimes called the twins, because of their friendship and their closeness and age, especially later when they weren't living among the Mormons. By that time, James had two sister wives living in different houses in the same town. Those two sister wives did not get along, but his five young sons sometimes did. James had a good job with the railroad in Ogden, but he, and he had other non-Mormon family that had moved to America from Denmark and who were then living at the other end of the railroad ties in Omaha, Nebraska. James was also very aware of and disappointed by the fact that he knew he would never be a more, the Mormon leader that he had tried to be for so long. After working at the railroad office, he knew he could make a good living in towns, and he, so he felt like he was destined to be more than just a settler in the wilderness. There was one more thing that he knew. Even before he moved across the, the, the big pond, the ocean. Back in 1862, polygamy or bigamy or having two or more plural wives was illegal in the United States, except in Mormon areas, and a bigamist was subject to arrest and incarceration. James had an option. He could stay relatively safe within the Mormon communities, but he'd be unhappy with his situation and his two wives. Or he could go to Omaha on the railroads he worked for, rejoin other family, and then see what he could do there. But he would have to be doing, he would have to be very careful or he could be arrested as a bigamist. If he were arrested, what would become of his family? James Borglum Sr. decided he had to make some changes before moving. He chose to unseal his marriage from his second wife, Christina. Then James took his first wife, Ida Mickelson Borglum, and her three Borglum sons back to Nebraska to live. Remember, they'd passed through Nebraska once before. The family also brought their housekeeper, AKA Christina Mickelson, formerly Borglum, <laughs> with them. And also her two sons. So Christina, um, let's see, according to, that was according to the 1870 census. 
And those two boys were truly secret brothers and James's secret sons during that time in Nebraska. While in Nebraska in 1871, a doctor friend soon encouraged James Sr. to take his family and go to school in St. Louis, Missouri to become a doctor. While the family was packing to leave for St. Louis, James's former second wife, AKA housekeeper Christina, was also packing to start a new life of her own. Aunt Tina, as she then came to be called, kissed her own two sons, Gutson and Solon, goodbye, and moved in with her own parents who were living in Omaha. She later remarried and moved away, having nothing much to do with her own first two sons. They belonged to her husband. In 1874, Dr. James Borglum brought his own Borglum family back to Nebraska from St. Louis, first to Omaha, then to Fremont, and then back to New Omaha. People often wondered how Dr. Borglum and his wife could have so many sons so close together in age. <coughs> Eventually, they would even have nine children, six boys and three girls. Back in Nebraska, Gutson often ran away, looking for his missing mother. Solon often accompanied his father to various ranches, Indian camps, and more, and helped with the doctoring of people and animals. Solon especially loved horses, the Old West, cowboys, and Indians, and that would all show up in his own later world-class artworks and sculptures. When the family moved back to Omaha from Fremont, Solon really missed being out in the country. When oldest brother James Miller Borglum went off to California, Half-brother Gutson followed him and took, an art, took art classes out there. The whole rest of the family later took the train to California in 1883. Along the way, James Sr., who had stock in the railroad by then, seems to have bought a square mile of sandy, sandy Bluffs land just west of a tiny new town called Carroll, Nebraska. Ever heard of it? I just mentioned it a little while ago. Just northwest of Grand Island. The family stayed in California for a few years. James also owned part of a cattle ranch along the California coast, and Solon and his half-brother twin, Ar Arnold, worked there most of the time. When the family returned to Nebraska, Solon badgered his father to let him turn that Carroll, Nebraska land into a cattle ranch. His father agreed. Solon also rebuilt a new nearby school, finished his schooling there, going from Creighton Prep to country school with other younger kids, and became the sheriff of the Carroll area, though he refused to carry a gun. But he was always really good at keeping the peace. While living at his new ranch, Solon also became an artist, drawing pictures on any scraps of paper he could find, digging clay from the ground to form small sculptures, and carving the huge head of at least one Indian into one of the surrounding tall and sandy bluffs just northwest of Carroll, along what is now Nebraska's Scenic Highway 2, or Byway 2. By the way, we put up a, a Nebraska history marker there, six miles west of Carroll, thanks to a lot of what Fred did and the historical society in our county, in that county. One day, Solon's brother, Gutson, came back from living in Europe with Gutson while, excuse me, where Gutson was becoming world known as an artist, just for his drawings and paintings. He wasn't yet a sculptor. Gutson was not yet doing the sculptures. Solon took his brother Gutson out to the Sandy Bluffs to show him the huge Indian head that he, Solon, was sculpting in the bluffs. Older brother Gutson was astounded, impressed, and perhaps a bit overwhelmed and jealous that he hadn't thought of using the land as his media yet. But he would. He was inspired by his little brother Solon's talent, and that probably led years later to Gutson's own carvings of presidents on Mount Rushmore. Solon was also inspired by Gutson, and both brothers would soon become world famous as competitors, as sculptors, sculptors, excuse me, and artists. Even though you've probably never ever heard of Solon Borglum, the secret brother who the French later called the sculptor of the prairie. There's far more to this story in my book, Secret Brother, the story of Solon Borglum, the sculptor of the prairie, but my speaking time is nearing the end of this, of this trail. But by the way, this, later this afternoon, I think there's supposed to be a cemetery tour at the Mormon Trail Center. Or was that right yesterday? I think it was today. And it's indeed a beautiful cemetery, but there is also another cemetery about five minutes west of here. It was called, it was mentioned this morning, Forest Lawn, where several of Omaha's Borglums are buried, though not the two secret brothers, not Gutson and Solon. But their father, James Borglum, the one I talked about to begin with, he was once buried there at Forest Lawn in a temporary holding vault to wait for his two world famous sculptors and one secret sons, Gutson of Mount Rushmore fame and Solon, who would also be a world class known as 
sculptor of the prairie, to create a magnificent mausoleum for their father. That didn't happen. The two once very famous brothers didn't always get along, like their mothers, no, like the mother, their, their mother and their, her sister. And Solon went off to help in World War I, where he was not a soldier, but he was revered by soldiers of all the allied countries and was nicknamed the American and was given the French Cross of War, the Croix de Guerre. Solon came home, but unexpectedly passed away way too soon to do that monument, that mausoleum for their father. Eventually, their father's body may have been removed from the holding bowl at Forest Lawn and cremated, maybe, perhaps with his ashes being returned to the family. And then somehow his body or his ashes have gone missing and they've been lost to the ages. That part's not in the book I found out on Find a Grave. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed learning about these two secret brothers, their father, their mother, uh, mothers, their Mormon and Mount Rushmore connections in this book. I'm Dr. Jean A. Lukish. Thank you for taking this trail with me today.